Hi again, I'm JP Hong from Seoul, Korea, and this time I'll be talking to you briefly on our thinking process of selecting perforator flaps. Now, I think there are three major phases when you think about doing a perforator flap. Pre-op is to analyze the defect, uh, look at the overall circulation of the leg, especially if you're doing diabetic foot reconstruction, um, and, and then after you analyze the defect and on the overall circulation, thinking about which recipient site, then you start thinking about which flaps to take. Intraoperatively, I like to approach, I like to do the debridement, then look at the recipient, and then where the recipient is in, 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 in that consideration, then select the flap, and then after I elevate the flap, do the micronastomosis, and then of course it's the final stage of post-operative care. So, so let's take a look at this defect for a minute, and you can see that this patient has a huge defect in the anterior tibial artery. And you can see that this patient having a CT angiogram doesn't have a anterior tibial artery, but only has a posterior tibial artery. So, what did you look at, and what did you uh, look um, uh, at? What, what did you see when you evaluated the defect? So, for me, I looked at what's missing: the bone was missing, the muscle was missing, and part of the skin was missing. And also, we looked at the artery, uh, which was only the posterior tibial artery was viable. And when you look at these kind of uh, 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 defect, uh, the first question that comes in a lot of people's mind is whether or not to use perforator flap versus muscle flap. And I think uh, for me, um, I don't mind which flap you use, but I, I like to use like with like. Um, and, and we know that through uh, papers that there's no difference in recurrence of chronic osteomyelitis as long as you keep the good principle of debridement, uh, you obliterate the dead space. And then it doesn't matter if you use a skin flap or a muscle flap. Uh, I think muscle gives you great flexible uh, ability. It, it obliterates the defect very well. Um, I think it also gives you a nice skin coverage. But there is, a, of course, the downside of having a, a more donor side morbidity. So maybe skin flap is better. And of course, skin flap, in, in my uh, opinion, it could be aesthetically superior. So a lot of my practice has migrated from just using muscle flaps for resurfacing to now using um, propeller uh, for, to using uh, operator flaps. So today I'd like to talk to you about how do we select a operator flap for various defects and what is our thinking algorithm or the thinking um, uh, mindset. So here going back to this defect again with the bone, muscle, and um, and skin defect, uh, what do we use? We could use ALT with vastus lateralis, uh, and of course use uh, antibiotic beads. Uh, we could take a fibula if it's clean, uh, use ALT and vastus lateralis. Or you could do an LD instead of vastus lateralis and just cover it with a bone graft. So there's multiple choices that you could, you could think about. If that's the flap that you're thinking, then how do we choose these flaps? We thought about the defect, so this patient is missing a muscle, is also missing the part of the skin. So if the flap is composed with muscle and skin, that will probably be the best. How large is the defect? That's the next thing we look at. And we have to think about a flap coverage dimension. And then remember where the medical, uh, where the recipient vessel was. It was the posterior tibial. So if you want to go to the posterior tibial, do an empty side, you have to take a long flap. So is there a flap that would give me a muscle skin composition that's able to cover this um, uh, uh, probably larger than palm size um, uh, defect and also give me a long flat pedicle. So that's the thing, that's the, uh, the algorithm that we have to think. So let's look at these defects and think about where the defects are and then think about the algorithm. Uh, what about plantar reconstruction? What do we do then? What are, you know, what, how large is the defect? And in plantar surface, we also have to think about the durability of the skin. So the next thing we think about is if you're going to do plantar, especially when you're going to do plantar reconstruction, you have to think about the durability, which is the thickness of the skin itself. And in our body, the thickness is all different. The plantar and palmar surface is the thickest skin. The next is buttock. The next is back. And then the uh, next is the anterior surface, especially the anterior lateral thigh. So these are in regards to um, skin thickness. So, so these are the things that I like to think break down when I start start to thinking about what is my flap choice? What is the defect? And I base the flap composition. How large flap do I need? So dimension. How much pedicle length do I need? And finally, do I need a thick flap or a thin flap? 
and thickness of the skin itself. So these are the things that I think about. And finally, during our surgery, you know, there is sometimes prone position, there's supine position, and you know, sometimes uh, if the if the defects in the back, then we have to do prone. Sometimes we do supine, and we also have, and and I like for me. I don't like to change patient position because if you change the patient position, we know that the complication of the of the patient will increase to about 10 to about 18 percent. So I try to avoid um, changing the patient at all. So finally, we like to think about the position of the patient. So again, composition, dimension, pedicle length, the thickness of the skin itself, and finally, the position of the patient. So where do we harvest from the front or the back? So we were actually looked at our 563 cases of the perforator flaps we did, and we actually came up uh, with this algorithm of thinking. Patient position is in the front or is in the back, then flap size, then flap thickness, uh, flap composition, and finally, the pedicle length. So these are the five factors that we think about when we're doing um, perforator flaps. Uh, to reconstruct, especially the extremity. So here's the case. We look at it. Composition. We just need skin, prone position, uh, supine position. Uh, we could use the anterior tibial because it looks like the defect is over the defascia. Uh, we could have a short pedicle length if you're going to use anterior tibial artery. Uh, flap size. We know the thickness, the thinner the better. It's the coverage of the uh, anterior tibia. So in this case, we take a skip flap and we hook it up with a short pedicle. So this is the kind of thinking we do. So here, this patient is in prone position. Um, it's very difficult to use um, uh, uh, the lateral aspect of the heel, to, to use a, a, a recipient in the lateral uh, aspect of the heel. So probably you'll have to go through the anterior tibial or the posterior tibial, or you could use a, a small perforator in the lateral ankle. Composition is probably you only need, um, uh, you only need um, skin, but I think you would prefer to have thick skin because it's a weight-bearing area. And of course, if you're going to use the lateral um, uh, lateral tarsal artery, the pedicle length could be short. So in this case, although some people might disagree, uh, harvest the flap from the, the thickest skin in our body, which is the buttock skin, and elevate it as a thin flap and to do the reconstruction of the heel. So in this case, we use the gluteal artery perforator flap. And again, and you can see how well these five stages of thinking uh, can be applied to most of the extremity defects. So I think you know we just uh, took a look, quick look at um, how to think of the algorithm in selecting perforator flaps. But a lot of the times, as we've shown in these multiple cases, you know the problem, the main problem, is always the recipient vessel condition. Where is it? Is it a single vessel? We have to have a long pedicle, or uh, is it uh, atherosclerosed? Uh, is it a um, uh, is it an injured vessel? So these are the things that really limit us to doing a lot of microsurgery. And this is where we came up with the concept of using perforator flap as a recipient vessel, a doing a perforator perforator approach, uh, and really doing it a true um, a true um, a freestyle approach. And you know, if you think about it, if you use a perforator perforator, the flow uh, and the diameter match could also be ideal. And in the lower extremity, there are always constantly large perforators coming out from these major axial vessels, and which are really great to use. So throwing in just perforator to perforator really allows you to be free from the factor of always selecting a long pedicle. As seen here, just adjacent to the defect, we see a nice perforator, and we're able to use that. When you do perforators, fine instruments will help you. And finding this perforator here, uh, doing an end-to-end -end approach, doesn't need you to have a long pedicle, a short pedicle length, and we're able to uh, do a super microsurgery, and then anastomose. And this is the final result, having a, a really uh, reasonable care. And as you can imagine, we're not using high pressure axial uh, vessels, so the post-operative care could be a little bit different. So using this kind of perforators as a recipient, using these perforator flaps has really changed a lot of my uh, thinking process in selection of flaps in the lower extremity. In the thigh, you basically never need free flaps. They're abundant of tissue, and you can quickly elevate a flap based on a single perforator, rotate it, and you're able to reconstruct it without any um, free flaps. Uh, even for the feet, sometimes you could do a quick propeller flap after you do a complete debridement and have a, a pretty uh, good result. So again, most of the thigh is always about propeller flaps or keystone flaps, but if you're doing the lower, lower leg, 
it would be based on the patient position, medical length, skin size, composition, and, and finally, the thickness of the skin. So with that, I hope I sort of shared our thinking of selecting perforator flaps for lower extremity reconstruction. These are the five stages, and, and I hope this helps you to select the right perforator flap in your uh, reconstruction of the leg. So with that, thank you very much.